Thank you so very much to Chris and Melissa. Next up, we will hear from our POSA presenters. After each presentation has concluded, we will have a short time for Q&A with the presenter. Just like earlier formats, please use the raised hand feature if you would like to ask a question or share a comment, or you can use the Q&A text feature. We will be addressing the raised hands first, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Please, first up, please welcome Deanna Farr. Okay. Hello. Can you all hear and see me? Yes, we can. Okay, just checking. My name is Dr. Deanna Farr. I am an assistant professor at East Carolina University, and I'm here to talk with you about a project that I'm working on with several statewide collaborators. Um, and the goal of the project was to look at patients' perceptions of a male fit pilot intervention in a seven colorectal cancer hotspot. And let's see, do I have control now of the presentation? Yes, you do. Just please click right. the center of the screen. All right, so I've clicked, but it's not advancing to the next slide. Let's see. You may need to click again. Hold on one second. There we go. All right, so I have nothing to disclose, unfortunately. All right, so just to give you a little bit of background on um, this particular health topic, as we all well know, there's been increased push to, um, you know, reduce colorectal cancer death rates across the nation. And the best way we can do this is by increasing screening rates. However, we still have parts of the country, um, many rural areas in particular, where we have elevated um, rates of colorectal cancer mortality, such as um, one of the areas I'm going to talk to you about in eastern North Carolina. And as a result, one of the most important um, recommendations that we can engage in is to use multi-component interventions to increase colorectal cancer screening rates. So this is combining um, interventions that target client, um, client receptiveness to screening, as well as to target providers and um, encourage their actions to facilitate screenings. Despite the fact that many of these interventions have been tested individually and in combination, many of these interventions have not been tested in rural areas. And so there's definitely a need to understand how um, we may need to tailor or adapt some of these interventions um, to make it um, more sex, make it easier for us to implement them in rural settings. And as with that, that is part of the work of the project that I'm representing, the SCORE project, which stands for Scaling Colorectal Cancer Screening Through Outreach, Referral, and Engagement. Specifically, as part of SCORE is one of several um, uh, National Cancer Institute funded studies where they're trying to um, find ways to increase colorectal cancer screening in a variety of different settings, rural areas, um, border areas, etc. Lots of vulnerable populations. With SCORE, our focus is actually trying to increase client demand by the use of a centralized mail fit program. So we've created a kind of central registry where we can pull data from various state level sources across North Carolina and determine um, which patients are truly eligible for colorectal cancer screening, making sure that we're not targeting patients who just have incomplete medical records. Um, so making sure that we gain data from multiple sources to develop a true screening registry. Um, and then also, once we've identified who's eligible for screening, our focus is then to um, uh, send them small media. So we send them an introductory letter about um, colorectal cancer screening and letting them know that they're due, as well as um, subsequently a fit kit um, in the mail. So that's a, a mailed stool test. And we send them that as well as additional reminders. For those participants who end up having abnormal results, we also have patient navigation in place to help them um, go through the process of obtaining and completing a screening colonoscopy. So the patients who are eligible for this particular project are in the age range of 50 to 75. 
They've been active patients at one of our partnering clinical sites. We have two fairly qualified health center um, sites in North Carolina, one in the Western um, area and one here in the East, uh, close to where I live in Greenville. And if patients have been, had a clinical site, a clinical visit within the past 18 months at either of those sites, they are eligible as well as if they are of average colorectal cancer risk. We, um, as you know, fit tests and stool tests are not recommended for people with above average risk. Also, we want to make sure that they're due for colorectal cancer screening. So making sure that they've not had a stool test in the past 12 months or a colonoscopy in the past 10 years. And so that is what we do at the SCORE project. And actually the trial, the randomized clinical trial of this project is gonna be starting in the fall. But prior to doing the trial, we needed to get more information about how to adapt this intervention for our specific setting. And so part of what we did was conduct the pilot uh, of the trial last year. And um, my work with uh, the team was to help um, collect information from patients and to understand how their perceptions of the male fit program and figure out ways that we could adapt it and increase um, the effectiveness of the program. So we conducted qualitative interviews with participants who had received male fit tests between February and May. Um, we could particularly focus on people who completed um, the, in, the, the fit test but had negative results, so they had no cancer or no abnormal findings, um, as well as people who did not complete the, the FIT test um, by the time we started interviews. People who had abnormal results, we actually interviewed them in a later set of interviews so that we could understand the colonoscopy follow-up process. And so that information is not included in this presentation. Um, when we decided who we wanted to interview, we used maximum variation sampling. So our goal was to balance our group of interviewees across these four different categories. So first would be age, um, gender, race, and then completion status. So balancing between people who completed and who, had, um, who did not complete. And so we ended up interviewing 10 participants between July and September of 2019, transcribed all of those interviews, had them professionally transcribed, we coded them, and then we looked at, looked for themes across all of the interviews, as well as looking for themes just by completion status. Okay. So um, in general, there were some things that were common to everyone. A lot of people indicated that privacy was a benefit of a fit male fit program. They liked the idea of you know receiving it at home and not having to worry about whether or not people in a clinical setting who are also their neighbors because they live in a rural area um, would know why they came to the doctor or would know what kind of tests that they were um, participating in. So that was something that came through um, as well as the convenience as well. Um, however, there was definitely a specific challenge that was very focused on rural areas. There were lots of people who talked about the issues with mail. Um, you'll see in this quote right here, you have people who will talk about the fact that they've had to replace mailboxes because of farming equipment, because we have these very small roads that more than one car can't pass at a time. And so that's a constant issue as well as other issues around mail theft that are really rampant in this area, um, as well as issues just with mail distribution. Um, for a lot of reasons, some of the mail in this area gets moved. Um, if you send a letter in this area, it will get routed to the nearest city two hours away and then sent back to this area if the, the um, addressee is in this area. So that slows down and or can, creates additional opportunities for missing mail. Um, another general theme that emerged was around sample collection. So the act of going through the packet and collecting your sample to put in your fit kit and then send back to um, the lab. 
a lot of people said that they were kind of confused and weren't sure exactly how to collect the sample, even though the instructions were in there. Um, and then, you know, when we go on and talk about there were some differences in how the folks who were completers handled that challenge versus non-completers. And so in think, looking across completion status, um, again, some interesting themes emerge as well as some interesting demographic information emerged. So uh, of the people who completed, half of the sample completed, most of them either completed a colonoscopy, well, completed some type of colorectal cancer screening prior to ever being in this project, or someone, a provider or some other staff member at the healthcare clinic told them that a test would be coming in the mail. Um, so they had some kind of additional kind of encouragement and or previous experience that may have made this a little easier for them, right? Um, and then also, you know, there was also some themes. A lot of people talked about preferring this to another test. So preferring this to older versions of stool tests, the FIT test is, people said, felt like it was more sanitary because of less of the the, the handling, they didn't have to handle the sample as much as the old stool tests. Um, some people just really preferred this to a colonoscopy for issues of challenging, you know, the logistics or just the idea of going to sleep. So there was a lot um, of people talking about preferring a stool test. And then we have non-completers. An uh, interesting demographic trend that emerged around non-completers is that none of those people had ever done any kind of colorectal cancer screening. Um, and so they had no real experiences to compare this, compare this with. Um, and also, like I said, there was also a bit around the sample collection piece. They, those people said that they had, um, they were kind of confused about collecting the sample, but they were more likely to kind of just throw their form somewhere or kind of put the packet off to the side and couldn't tell me what happened with the packet, um, what they did with it or where it was, right? And as far as the themes go, upon having conversations with them, many of them talked about colonoscopy, but they seem to be unaware of other screening options. You'll see the quote on the left, it describes an exchange where we ask, you know, did you did your provider mention any other kind of test that you could take since you didn't want to do a colonoscopy? And she just said, no, you know, that's the only test that was mentioned. So a couple of people indicated that as well as concerns about accuracy. Some people wondered if a blood, you know, a, a blood stool test, a fit test would be as accurate as an actual colonoscopy. And so you see at least one of those kind of concerns in the quote box on the left. Sorry to interrupt you, but we have about three minutes left, including Q&A. Great. So I'm on the last slide. So again, um, these are the findings. We revealed some barriers and strategies that are specific to, you know, rural um, areas. And, you know, there were several factors that encourage completion. And we've used this information um, to revise our current um, protocol and make changes to the, the materials that we make mail out the way we mail them out, um, some of the instructions, and we've also been able to include a link to a video to help facilitate um, this intervention. However, we do feel like there are more strategies that are going to be needed to increase um, a mail fit um, response rate in a rural area. And with that, um, I just wanted to thank all of the many state partners that are available, particularly my um, colleagues at U UNC Chapel Hill, which are the leads on this project. And um, I think we're ready for questions. Looks like we have a raised hand from Erica. Please unmute your microphone so we can hear you ask a question. Hi, uh, Dr. Deanna. Did you mention that there was a video sent out to participants? Did I hear that right? Yes, so we've worked, uh, American Cancer Society is also one of our partners, and so um, we worked with them and there was already a video available, so we were able to put it into kind of like an easy to type in format on the 
introductory letter as well as in like reminder letters and in the packet so that participants can look at the video around how to collect the sample if they're confused about that. Oh, okay. It wasn't a promotional. It was more instructional based. Yeah, no, it was, it was instructional because that it was directly in response to some of the challenges that people had with the sample. Like they thought that they were actually going to have to touch the sample. Like there was a lot of confusion, even though they received paper materials. And is there a link to that video to view it or as a resource? Um, I can find that if it, um, I can, I don't have it right at hand for me, right at hand right now, but I can find that and either send it to the, um, the program organizers or if you want to send me your contact information directly, I can go ahead and send that to you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Next, we have Kathleen Porter with her presentation. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so my name is Kathleen Porter and I'm an assistant professor within the Public Health Sciences Department within the U University of Virginia School of Medicine. And as I'm trying to get my screen to move forward. You'll have, there you go. Ah, there we go. Um, we have, myself and my co-authors, we have no disclosures um, to make. This would be the poster if we were physically um, together and pretend you can pretend I'm talking alongside of it if you'd like. And so my presentation is around how our group has built community capacity to hopefully build sustainable cancer control interventions in Appalachian, Virginia. I'm presenting um, obviously for a team of folks, none of this work is done by ourselves and the co-authors on this are a mix of faculty members, staff, um, outreach and engagement staff from our um, cancer center as well as one of our community partners. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, we have no conflicts to report. We do want to acknowledge the rest of our team that's been part of this in the larger Cancer um, Center Without Walls group. Also want to recognize the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute. There's a typo on the slide, of course, um, or PCORI. Um, the, all this work was done through an engagement contract that they had, that we had been awarded through them. And thinking about our background, just to kind of put you in place and give you some context for our work, we think about the background that we want to share with you in two ways. First is Southwest Virginia. So just to give you a picture of where we're working in Virginia, we're really working in this far Southwest corner. Parts of this are seven, eight hours away, at least from Washington DC, from Norfolk area, and then this is, this is the area in blue, and then the area in orange is actually where Charlottesville is, where the University of Virginia Cancer Center is housed. And this area, we even have parts of this that are about six hours, three to six hours away. Um, my group is actually housed in between. And so when we think about Southwest Virginia, we think about primarily rural Appalachian communities. This is the Appalachian region of Virginia. We also know that these communities tend to be medically underserved and that they're impacted by other poor social determinants of health. When we think about South, these counties in Southwest Virginia, when we look at them in terms of the Health Opportunity Index, we're seeing counties and cities that score as poor or very poor on that index. And we see that what Southwest Virginia looks like is more like the Appalachian counties in Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia that border it, not sort of like the wealthier um, communities and counties that we might see in other parts of the state. And when all of this comes down to it from a cancer perspective, this area is disproportionately impacted by cancer. When we look at Appalachian counties within the Appalachian states, these counties have a 15% to 36% higher mortality rate than their non-Appalachian um, counterparts within their states. And we also know that within the state of Virginia, the mortality index ratio for 
cancer is a lot higher here. So we're having more um, cancer deaths and lower incidence from lower incidence, which is definitely a problem. But we always think about a lot of these things within the confines of, oh, these are all the things that are going on where they need to be intervened on. But we also know that when we look at Southwest Virginia, we're looking at communities that care about their communities and they also care about the region and one another so that there is strength in the people and in the organizations that serve these regions. And so what the UVA Cancer Center has done is established this cancer center without walls, and I'm gonna be calling it the CCWW moving forward. And basically this is the means by which the cancer center connects and harnesses the resources that we have three to six hours away in Charlottesville and being able to bring them to all parts of our catchment area. I'm specifically going to be talking about the Southwest Virginia Community Advisory Board, but this cancer center without walls can go throughout the catchment area, which is pretty much everything west of that little orange circle kind of signaling where Charlottesville is and actually does go into parts of um, West Virginia as well. But looking specifically at Southwest Virginia, our community advisory board or CAB in this region was established in 2013. And today it includes about 40 representatives from three health districts. And these representatives are members of or staff from organizations that are cancer focused, healthcare organizations, individual citizens who are just interested in cancer, cancer survivors. It's pretty much anyone who's interested in cancer and wants to be part of this can be part of this group. And between 2013 and about 2018, what the group was really engaged in was having the partner members share what they were doing. So coming and updating, this is the work our organization or my research group is doing around cancer in this area. And what we realized through that, the community was really having limited roles in research. For the most of it, they were really participating in lower end ways and not being able to engage and drive the research. And we realized that that was a massive issue and something that we could change. And so Jamie Zellner, who is the PI of this BACORI application, one of the co-authors on this presentation, in submitted a PI grant to PCORI in 2018. And this grant really focused on how can this Southwest Virginia Community Advisory Board advance its capacity to conceptualize, plan, execute, and sustain reach regional cancer control projects while also and using this as an opportunity to develop more projects that can go into the region addressing the community's needs. And so what this presentation is really going to do is describe how our CAB members systematically identified these priority cancer controlled needs during the first year of this project. There's two years in this project, so I'm only talking about year one. But what we also wanted to do is talk about how the CAB's capacity has changed throughout this process. And this is a picture of some of the members of the CAB, I believe in about 2016. And so I wanted to talk about our group's organization. That top bar where we have just the Cancer Center Without Walls board, we have chairs that represent our different districts. And prior to 2018, that was the largest driving force for organizing this group. But with the advent of this, these funds from PCORI, we were able to structure ourselves a little bit differently so that we were able to get into action teams. And we really focused on our action teams through a collective decision around areas of prevention and early detection. And having sort of committee chairs kind of running those that were a mix of community partners, researchers, and our outreach and engagement staff. And as you can see from this image, I was um, tasked with being that chair for our prevention group. And so as we went through this prioritization process and trying to think about building our capacity, we did use guiding frameworks. So with the systematic process that we were using to identify our priority needs, we used the comprehensive planning, a comprehensive participatory planning and evaluation process or CPPE. I will use CPPE because as you can see, I already stumbled over the full name of it. But what this is, is a five-step process that allows partners to collaboratively identify problems, find solutions, and measure outcomes for it. And then when we think about our capacity evaluation, this was guided by the American Cancer Society's Nine Habits of Successful Comprehensive Cancer Control Coalition. So we looked at different factors from that, um, th those habits. And then to kind of walk you through what we've done, we our prioritization process, we started immediately 
um, when the project started in November of 2018, and really starting to just brainstorm what are the root causes of disparities related to prevention and early detection in this region. We did this through an in-person meeting. And then over the course of the year, we primarily focused on this step one, really this problem assessment and getting to the root of this problem. We developed causal models and then really dug in and prioritized these concerns. And we did a lot of this through a mix of in-person meetings as well as some um, conference meetings with video chat. We are a highly rural area. Um, it can take some of our partners even two and a half hours to get to meetings. So this was a good way for us to be able to work together um, in between. And honestly, now as we continue to work, with the restrictions around COVID-19, it's we've actually been able to adapt very well to this process. And then also I did want to mention that in February of 2019, we did do a webinar with the group around different interventions that have worked trying to let them see what these potential interventions, what we could really be working towards because not everyone had um, the background knowledge in that area. And what I'd like you to do is just to do is just show you this prioritization process kind of in action. So we started with the Virginia Cancer Plan. I believe all or most states have this. And what our outreach and engagement staff, um, Lindsay and Noel, who are also co-authors on this project did, was they adapted it to be like, these are the needs specifically for Southwest Virginia. This is what it looks like in Southwest Virginia. So it would be able to, better able to prioritize based on real data. And then in our groups, we created those causal models, which was actually, a very fun um, activity and we it allowed you to approach things in very different ways. Our prevention group started looking at it as kudzu, so anyone from Appalachia knows it is growing over everything and then somehow it became a potted plant, but that's um, in and of itself. And the other group really, the early detection group really looked at it as a tree and roots, but being able to conceptualize what's going on. And then from that, using that information of these root causes as well as this data, we started prioritizing started saying these are the things that are priority, these are the things that are, feasible, that are feasible. And we literally had a meeting where we sat and we ranked um, all of these things within our individual groups. And then over the course of about six meetings, we went through whittling down these lists even further based on the evidence that we had at hand until we wound up with our top five or four, depending on the group. And in there, we really dug in a bit more just trying to see, all right, what are really going to be our priorities? Because there was a lot that we were choosing from. And what we wound up with, oops, hopefully it just doesn't go forward. Oh, and it did go forward. Sorry to interrupt, but we have about three minutes left for the rest of your presentation and Q&A. Okay. Um, and what we wound up with were um, priority areas around tobacco use, HPV vaccination, and um, early detection around CRC and lung cancer. And what we also did was conduct evaluation um, using surveys um, at the beginning and the end of the year and um, interviews at the end of the year as well. And what we found there was that we were making significant changes in all of these groups. Um, it's important to know we did start high because the group had been working together, but we did make significant gains. And we also identified strengths that the group has been doing, including moving forward and really starting to routinize um, some of our actions so that we can move forward and can make changes. And we also identified areas where we would still be needing improvement. And some of these particularly came around membership and communication. And our next steps over the year two, what we've really been working on is focusing on steps two, three, and four. Um, our HPV focus group has actually put in an NIH application, which we should be hearing from soon about it. And our tobacco and our CRC groups are also working actively working on applications. We've also restructured ourselves so that we are working in those smaller groups. And we are conducting the um, the final capacity evaluation. Um, and I literally had my interview and my survey completed yesterday. And our implications, this work um, enhances the likelihood that cancer control projects can be sustained, particularly because our, our partners are involved in them and we're developing capacity so that there can be research around them. And then for other, for cancer prevention and control in other regions, this process really highlights ways that Capacity can be built elsewhere, but provides a systematic sort of framework where other cancer control focus groups can help build capacity and prioritize their needs. 
So that was everything I had. So any questions, I'd love to hear them.